societies that are better protected uh, in general by persons who have been incarcerated, by, by incarcerating people. Are there some people who really need to be in prison? Absolutely. You know, uh, I wouldn't want to live in a society where uh, you know you didn't have prisons um, or police, so to speak. But uh, no, the prisoners are not doing their job. And um, I think that's basically by design. I used to train lawyers across the state of Illinois, and I said, you know, guilty people or innocent people don't confess. That was my mantra. Innocent people don't confess. If you've got a confession, move on. Concentrate on the death penalty issues. Concentrate on the issues so we can save this guy's life. And um, wh boy, was I wrong. Of course, I was in the kitchen working. And I was so used to hearing the officers telling me, hey, come on, pack up, you're going home. When they told me this on January 6th, I thought they were playing as well. You know, ah, you're playing again, leave me alone, I'm cooking. They're like, no, we're serious today, you're going home today. I still thought that they were playing, you know, and until I had the actual warden come to the kitchen and tell me, no, you need to leave now. And they got me out within an hour and a half. He escorted me out from prison, which they haven't done that in a very long time. Uh, I mean, I knew that the system was intellectually corrupt, uh, that it was, uh, people have used the word uh, broken. I would dispute that. It was, it's not broken, it's dysfunctional. Broken implies that at one time it was not broken. It's always been broken. You know, I've been opposed to the death penalty all of my life. I mean, since I was a little kid, I, I just remember having these notions of what if they got the wrong guy? was the male role model, you know, he was my big brother and I knew if anything ever happened to me that I could just call him and it would be solved. He was, he was our protector, you know, he was the one there for us. And when I came out here uh, to Chicago, uh, it was right after the Democratic National Convention and um, I was I uh, was friends with someone else, I went to Northwestern Law School, and uh, who was again much more involved in, in political and radical type of, of activities and, uh, as a law student, and she got me involved with the lawyers and uh, who ultimately started the People's Law Office. And then when we come back, we do a circle where we pass a talking piece. Um, and only the person holding the talking piece can speak. And this is where the men reflect. And one of the inmates said, you know, he said, I was so upset when I found out that you misidentified Stephen Avery and that someone had served that many years in prison um, that I just wanted to get up and, you know, come over and assault you. I was just, and the guy was being really honest. And he said, but over lunch, some of the other men in the group talked to me and said, if Stephen Avery can forgive her, who are you to sit in judgment? I mean, it was like my third day out. I, I, you know, to be honest with you guys, I wanted to go back. I really did, man. The third day, I was just, it was too much. It was, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe you guys' moms have in the kitchen the little knife holders. You know, my mom, the biggest one, the butcher knife, I slept with it for almost, you know, a month. You know, and I used to get up, you know, there was one morning she asked, she goes, hey, did you see my, my, my big knife? I said, what big knife? She goes, my butcher knife, the, the one that's in the knife. I said, well, this one here? I said, what are you doing with it? I'm like, you know, I locked all the windows. She lives on the second floor, and I'm locking all the windows. She's like, what are you doing that for? Somebody could climb up here and climb in the window. She goes, why would somebody want to do that for? I said, I don't know. I, just, you know, I felt secure, man. I, you know, so I locked all the doors, locked all the windows, and it took me. You know, I was, it was, I was scared. I 
I personally think, my personal opinion, is that my pop needed this. He needed this rehabilitation. He needed it, and I think that in many ways, I, c I could think this guy, you know, of point of strung out on drugs, could have killed, he could, my father probably could have died being so strung out and hung out with drugs and gangs and stuff. And I think now he came forward now because I think God personally told that guy, it's time now, he's done his time already. And I think he's done it. So in many ways, I do thank him from both sides, from then and now. You know, it wasn't his fault. It's not his fault. You know, he was 12 years old. You know, I think it's the cop's fault. You know, the person thinks it's the cop, and I think he needs to step forward and do some apologizing too because he's put these guys, up, not just my pop, there's a bunch of guys out here putting their lives away and keep away from their family for a paycheck. Retirement, okay, that's fine. But he lives, he lives, he lives his life in vain. So, but I don't have no hatred towards anybody.